This is an oral history interview with Dave Owen for the Robert J. Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. We're in Dave's office at uh, ICOP, ICOP Digital Inc. in Lenexa, Kansas. Today is Friday, April 20th, 2007, and I'm Brian Williams. Dave, let's start with a little bit of your family background, maybe when you all arrived in Kansas and so forth, okay. and take it from there. My family uh, from South Arkansas, and uh, we moved to Kansas when I was um, in about the third grade. We moved first to Galena, Kansas, which is down in the southeast uh, uh, corner of the state, a lead mining community. My father worked for the Internal Revenue Service at the time in the alcohol, uh, t uh, tobacco, and tax unit. Uh, he supervised uh, the manufacturing of whiskey, as a matter of fact, at uh, one of their distilleries, one of the distilleries down there. Uh, he was transferred to Kansas City, um, and I started the fifth grade here, and uh, we have lived here in this uh, community uh, ever since. And uh, at what point did, uh, tell me a little bit about your family's background politically. Overland Park was uh, the community that we moved to, and my family wasn't particularly active politically up until Overland Park decided to become a city. And that was, uh, I'm trying to remember back uh, when that occurred, but it had to be um, in the 50s, 1950s, and Overland Park decided to incorporate and elect a mayor and city council. And my father ran in the first race for mayor uh, of Overland Park. He was unsuccessful, but that was my first experience of observing my family getting active in the, in the political arena. Was that a partisan uh, position he ran for? No, it was, uh, it was not, although he was a Republican, and uh, he, was, he was beaten by a gentleman who was very active in the Democrat Party at that time. Uh, but uh, as I recall, it was a nonpartisan election. And in terms of your own educational background, give me a little Well, that's really, uh, I, I, gr I grew up here. I went to high school in Johnson County, Kansas. At the time, there was only one high school. There are many now, but uh, Shawnee Mission High School was the high school uh, that everyone in Johnson County went to. Uh, after I graduated from there, I went to Ottawa University at Ottawa, Kansas, and that's real, where I really began to get my political feet and connections uh, for a couple of reasons. One of my professors, my business law professor, uh, his name was Bob Anderson. He was an attorney in Ottawa, Kansas. He was also a member of the Kansas legislature in a, in, as a state representative. And we would talk politics with him uh, in our classroom, and I got my first taste of it uh, there. And then I had another professor, uh, Dr. Wayne Angel. Uh, Wayne was from Western Kansas, had gone to Ottawa University in KU, and was the economics professor at Ottawa, which was my major. And Wayne ran for the state legislature and took Bob Anderson's place in the state legislature. And again, there was a lot of political discussion in classrooms with him. As I got to my senior uh, year at Ottawa University, Bob Anderson was very active in politics, and there was a race for governor uh, between Huck Boyd, who uh, from Phillipsburg, Kansas, and John Anderson, attorney from Johnson County, Kansas. And Bob Anderson was supporting Huck Boyd, and he got me involved in Huck Boyd's campaign, and that was really kind of my first uh, entry into politics. And I was also, we formed a Young Republicans Club at Ottawa University, and I was the president of that. Well, Wayne Angel went on to become, uh, as I got out of college, more interested in moving up. And so after I graduated, uh, Wayne ran for the U.S. Congress from the 3rd Congressional District here that covered Johnson County and Franklin County, where Ottawa was located. And he asked me to help, and I became the Johnson County Chairman for Wayne Angel for Congress. And that's really where I built my political base, was working for him in that race. And uh, he was unsuccessful, but I had done a good enough job that the opponents in that race all came to me to see if I would, I would join them. And the eventual winner, Larry Wynn, uh, who served in Congress for many years, I worked on his campaign in the general election. 
after <clears throat> after that happened there was a redistricting going on in the Kansas uh, legislature because of reapportionment uh, population and Johnson County picked up one state Senate seat and I was interested enough at that point it just occurred to me one day I can do this and uh, so I looked at the political landscape and I saw that there were three incumbents in the state Senate and one new spot. And so I just arbitrarily said, okay, those guys get spot one, two, three, and I went to the courthouse and filed for position number four. And uh, I began to systematically use what I'd done with uh, Wayne Angel's campaign and my activities in the county. And I put together a very, very strong organization right down to the block level in every city in, in Johnson County. And uh, once we had the, the organization in place, I held a big party uh, down at what used to be the, the place to do this at the Glenwood Manor Hotel. And uh, I invited everybody I knew in politics plus my campaign committee. And all we did that night was bring my campaign committee across the stage and introduce them and so people would get up and say I'm Dave Owens campaign chairman in Leewood, Kansas, Ward 3, Block 3 or whatever it was and after that was over an interesting thing happened. There were something like 18 people running for the state senate but they all chose to run against the incumbents and I didn't even have a competitor. So we really won the primary the night of that party. And so I go into the general election with virtually no competition. There was a guy uh, filed against me, but it was not serious competition. And about that time, uh, my wife, uh, mother, had grown up, grown up in Russell, Kansas, home of Bob Dole. And she agreed to have a little fundraising coffee at her home. And that's the first time I ever met Bob Dole. We both came to that event and we both spoke to her friends and uh, we became acquainted. He running for the U.S. Senate at the time uh, because he had, uh, uh, after um, Senator Carlson retired, Bob ran for <coughs> the uh, for the United States Senate the same year I ran for the state Senate. His opponent was former Governor Bill Avery, who was considered a very tough opponent. And as things progressed, I had a tremendous organization and nothing to do. So Bob and I talked, and um, I basically just became his de facto campaign chairman in Johnson County, and my campaign organization worked on his behalf in his primary for the U.S. Senate. And he was successful. He beat Bill Avery and then went on to... Uh, to win the election uh, handily, and so that's where our relationship started. At the same time you were becoming politically active, were you pursuing any other professional life? Or? Yes, I was, uh, at the time all of this was going on, I uh, was working for a local bank in Johnson County, the Overland Park State Bank. And there was a very powerful uh, political business figure in Kansas City who owned that bank, uh, R. Crosby Kemper Sr. And so to do what I did in running for the state senate, I had to get his permission and he was very supportive and, and allowed me to do that or I never would have been able to get into the political arena at, at that stage of my life at all. But I was very young um, and in my mid-twenties when all of this occurred. Uh, so I um, worked at the bank for the first couple years I was in the state senate and then I left that bank and and started my own bank. I applied for a federal bank charter and received it and started the first of the banks that I had uh, ownership of. And located in what? That was located in Fairway, Kansas, which again is in Johnson County. And you, you, did you get a degree in business administration or something? Yes, my degree at Ottawa was uh, in business administration and economics. And as I said, my professor, uh, Dr. Wayne Angel, was uh, the guy I had most of my classes with who had a political interest. But interestingly enough, uh, he went on to become a member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors appointed by Ronald Reagan and then later in life became the chief economist for Bear Stearns. So 
again, I was very fortunate at Ottawa University to get someone with, uh, with that kind of business acumen uh, as an instructor. Sure, sure. So, how many terms did you serve in the State Senate? I served one term in the State Senate from uh, 1968 to 1972, and then uh, the opportunity came up to run for Lieutenant Governor. And um, again, I just uh, took a look at the, at the landscape and decided that I could do this. And so I filed for um, Lieutenant Governor. I gave up my uh, state senate seat, which I could have won handily probably for as long as I wanted to stay there. And uh, my opponent in that race, or at least the main opponent, was again uh, uh, a, a strong political figure, Calvin Stroig from Abilene, Kansas, who was Speaker of the House of Representatives at the time. And uh, again, I just went about uh, very systematically organizing my campaign in every county in the state and uh, using the connections that I developed in the state legislature at that point. And I won that race very handily. And it, uh, in that race, uh, it was the last time that the governor and lieutenant governor uh, ran separately. Uh, so I ran on my own. I was not running with a governor. Um, Bob Docking, a very strong political name in Kansas history, was the governor at the time and was elected, uh, elected governor again. And so he was the governor, I was the lieutenant governor. Um, but he and I had a very good relationship and worked uh, very well together. Was he running for the first time in 68 too, or were you joining him sort of in No, progress? as I recall, uh, that was his second, uh, that, that was his second term. So, did, you may have said this, excuse me if you did, did you defeat a, a standing candidate or a, a, a current lieutenant governor or not? Um, no, uh, the, um, I, I can't, honestly I can't remember quite what the lay of the land was on the other side, but uh, my, my primary opponent, the one I had to beat to win the office was Calvin Stroig, and, and I did that in the primary. Was it a big change for you going from a, a Senate district to statewide? How did that work? Well, I enjoyed it, actually. Um, my, my primary responsibility at the time was to preside over the Kansas Senate and uh, to head up the Kansas Economic Development Commission. And there were things that I was interested in. And, and uh, so I, I adjusted to that very well. And at the time I did that, uh, of course, I was young and ambitious and thought, you know, perhaps I would run for governor. But uh, back to the, um, back to the uh, business side of things, I had also applied for that federal bank charter along in there. And I really felt like I had to make a decision. Am I going to be a businessman here? Am I going to be a politician? And I had gotten that charter. I had an opportunity to build that bank and provide some real financial security. So uh, I didn't choose to run for re-election as lieutenant governor after that uh, term expired or run for governor, which I could have done. Um, so uh, that was where my association with Bob Dole took another turn. Well, maybe, maybe that's our next uh, topic, right? Okay. Well, what happened at that point was after um, and Bob and I had worked uh, together at, uh, over that period of time. He is a U.S. Senator and of course I was Lieutenant Governor and I was the top Republican office holder in the state and of course he was, uh, he was uh, the, the junior Senator from Kansas at that point because James Pearson was the senior Senator. And, um, but we remained uh, uh, in contact and when I decided not to run for Lieutenant Governor again, or for or for Governor, Bob called one day and said uh, that he would like for me to come to Washington. He'd like for me to take over his campaign um, for re-election to the to the Senate, and that was a very difficult time because this is 1974. Uh, Watergate had happened. Uh, Bob had gotten a divorce. Uh, Bill Roy was a very aggressive campaigner, and uh, Bob's campaign was pretty much in disarray. And um, so I went to Washington. We agreed that I would take over, and I got some pretty tough responsibilities right out of the job to, uh, to shoot to, to kind of straighten things out. 
in Washington. Well, we were we were meeting in Washington. I had to come back to Kansas and implement uh, implement the strategy. And uh, one of the problems was that uh, he had hired, uh, at the recommendation of Jack Danforth, a fellow by the name of Herb Williams, to be his campaign chairman. And Herb uh, was not a very good people person, and he had uh, the, the campaign in pretty much disarray, out of money, and and uh, it was uh, it was uh, well on its way to going down the tube. But at that point in time, I think uh, the Dole campaign was 13 points behind Bill Roy. And uh, so the first thing I had to do was uh, figure out a way to get. Herb Williams to resign and get out of the way without causing a lot of disruption and and um, so I met with Herb and uh, told him that uh, in my opinion the campaign was going down to defeat if we didn't do some things and clearly I didn't think he was up to the task and uh, convinced him to resign. Well he did resign uh, but uh, in resigning said he was about to write a book about Bob Dole so uh, Bob quickly got him a job at the Republican National Committee and that ended that squabble. Uh, so I, I took over the campaign, I went to Topeka, I sat down in the, um, in the campaign office and began to look at what was there and I quickly discovered that all we had was a mountain of bills and no cash. And <clears throat> So I, um, I called Clint Engstrand in Wichita, Kansas, an oil man there, just a fine gentleman, strong supporter of Bob Dole, and I told him what the dilemma was and asked if he could put uh, some kind of a fundraiser together to at least get us out of the hole so we had a fighting chance. And Clint called a, a fundraising uh, a meeting at the Petroleum Club in Wichita. I went down, I told them what the situation was, and I walked out with a hundred thousand, a little over a hundred thousand dollars in checks, which was a lot of money in those days. And we got uh, our bills paid up, we got uh, the campaign back on track. Again, I kind of brought my campaign organization into the Dole campaign because there wasn't a, a strong organization at that point. So with my campaign uh, organization coming in, that's what built the platform organizationally to take it from, from there. And we're talking late July, early August, and of course the, the election's November, so we didn't have a lot of time. Um, and so we began to very systematically, uh, uh, aggressively uh, go after um, uh, things we needed to do to shore the campaign up. And one of the first things I discovered, uh, as I sorted through those papers on the desk, I ran across an article that was, it was either in the Reader's Digest or some kind of an or, a paper, uh, magazine like that, that was a history of Bob Dole's um, career in, in the military, which most people had never really focused on in any kind of detail that I knew about. And it was a very compelling story um, about a young man who was a great athlete uh, at Kansas University, uh, came from the right kind of background in Russell, Kansas, a uh, handsome guy, physically fit, goes to the Po Valley in Italy and a grenade or something goes off and he spends three years in, in the hospital and comes back and fights his way back to where we all know he ended up. Well, I looked at that and I said, man, this is powerful stuff. And uh, so I put a flyer together and the words at the top of that flyer were just the word guts, G-U-T-S in big black letters. And I organized a, um, with the help of a lot of other people, I, I, I want to hasten to say, a lot of other people got involved in, in all of this. Um, but it was my job to kind of orchestrate it, and we put a, a statewide uh, a whistle stop tour together, and we went uh, to every little community in Kansas and motor homes and whatever we could scrounge up, and we just went up and down Main Street passing out these guts handouts. And I think that is the first time that Kansans ever came to grips with what Bob Dole had gone through to get where he was in the world today. So that was the start. And then 
uh, we had a uh, um, we had a uh, PR firm from Boston, Hill Holiday. Uh, Jack Connors was the head of that. He's he's become a very distinguished businessman, very successful businessman in, in Boston. I just talked to him uh, the other day for the first time in several years, but he's still around. And Jack uh, had produced a lot of commercials for Bob. Most of them were kind of the typical sort of uh, campaign commercials that you would see. Um, for you know, two old people talking about their social security check, or you know, the typical kinds of political ads, and we were just getting pounded. And Bob Docking uh, had had a guy in Kansas who did his political advertisements in years past, and they were just very simple but straightforward. And I, I cannot remember the guy's name that did these, but all it was was a guy sitting on a stool with a cigarette smoking a cigarette and he would just take the hide off of off of Bob Docking's opponents and it was very very effective well we just kept going down in the polls so I called Jack and I said Jack if you don't come up with something that's more hard-hitting I'm gonna make one of those docking type commercials down at uh, Channel 4 and we're gonna put them on the air and get rid of this stuff that we're, we're showing and I, and I actually did that. I went down to Channel 4 in Kansas City, Missouri. I got my own version of uh, Bob Docking's man. I sat him on a stool and we began to make commercials to just take the hide off of Bill Roy. And while we were there filming those, Jack Connors called me and he said, would you give me 24 hours to come up with an alternative? And I said, okay. So I held off putting those commercials on the air, although we eventually did put them on a time or two, but uh, the next day I get a package in the mail from Boston and I open it up and, and put the tape in the machine and it's uh, political ads that have gone down in political history, one called Mudslinger and one called Graffiti. And all in the world they were was uh, a poster of Bob Dole on the wall uh, Jack and his cohorts had mixed up a big barrel of mud over on the other end with a camera going, and they would say the they would say things. The announcer would say things like, "Bill Roy says Bob Dole was against the farmers because he voted against such and such and such and such," and a big splat of mud would just hit that poster in the face, and it was very compelling. It just you'd rock you back in your seat when you saw it on on TV. And the end of the commercial was, uh, but the truth is. Bob Dole voted very differently, whatever it had to say, and, the, and they just reversed the camera and the mud came off. The tagline was, all of which makes Bob Dole uh, look pretty good and makes Bill Roy look like a liar. Well, I saw that. I thought, man, this is the kind of stuff I'm looking for. I'm not sure liar is the right thing to say. Uh, and so I had to make another version that said all of which makes Bill Roy look like just another old politician. Well, when I had that ready, I called Bob Dole, I got him on the floor of the Senate, he went in the cloakroom and I said, we've got a commercial and I want you to read you what it says. And, I, and I, so I said, here's, and I gave him the liar version first and the, the phone went dead silent. <laughs> And, uh, but eventually just pretty much left it up to me. And uh, we went with uh, Bill Roy looks like just another old politician. Well, when we put those commercials on the air, um, the campaign started to take a turn. And every time they were on, uh, we'd start climbing in the polls a little bit. And when we had them off, it would either stall out or drop a little bit. And they were so compelling and so confusing that the pe some people thought, they were Bob Dole's commercials, and some people thought they were Roy's, and some people weren't sure, but Bob was getting a lot of, of people calling him saying, you've got to get that stuff off the air, because nothing like that had ever been on the air in Kansas politics before. That's just too, too tough. And, um, but Roy was getting a lot of calls from his constituents and said, what in the world are you doing throwing mud at Bob Dole's poster? <laughs> so it was pretty funny. Uh, but Bob would never call me. He would call Huck Boyd, uh, who was a national committeeman then, and Huck would call and say, Dave, are you sure that's the right thing to do to keep those on? And, 
it was pretty clear to me so I just kept putting them on the air and paying the money and we stayed the course with those commercials and frankly um, the way it turned out um, we won by I think at 13,000 votes statewide in that race so everything we did had to be right or he never would have won that um, he had a lot of baggage as I said Watergate uh, divorce right in the middle of the campaign um, all of the things that you would not want to have happen and when you're running for re-election and another incident uh, I, I would have to say I made a major mistake was uh, I thought that Bob Dole could debate Bill Roy at the Kansas State Fair uh, in an agricultural arena about things that the people in Hutchinson, Kansas and all over the state from the Agriculture Committee would, would like. And uh, so I agreed to, to ha holding this debate, even encouraged having this debate against uh, Bill Roy at uh, the State Fair in Hutch. And it just turned into a disaster. Um, as they went through it, uh, Bob has a tendency to just get more strident and strident sometimes in, in a situation like that. And uh, finally, he just turned to Bill Roy and asked him something to the effect as tell the people how many abortions you've done. And of course, that was a very, very touchy subject then and now and it just became a watershed political event in Kansas history um, because the, both the right and the left then came to the forefront, had a lot to do with the outcome of that campaign. The uh, pro-abortion, anti-abortion forces uh, coalesced and uh, Dole did not come off looking good in that debate, which plays into another scenario further down the line in his career that we can perhaps talk about later, but um, in any event, all the stars lined up and, and Bob Doe won. But even on election night, we were at the uh, Ramada Inn in Topeka, and it was so close, uh, Bob and I were the only ones up in his room, and uh, I, I kept thinking we were going to win the race. It looked like it to me from what I could see. He wasn't convinced and he had us uh, get on the phone and call every single county clerk in the state of Kansas to make sure that we weren't making a mistake before he would even go downstairs and, and uh, speak to people. But finally, we did all those, all that calling and uh, confirmed that, yeah, it looks like we've got it won. He went down and, and uh, won that race by a very, very narrow margin. Let's backtrack just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you, you obviously were running the show pretty much here in the state, uh, but he must have come in fairly often to campaign. How is he as a campaigner in 74? He is unbeatable as a campaigner. That's his strength. Uh, when he gets out in the communities one-on-one, -on -one, uh, meeting people on the street, talking to people, uh, one of the first things that attracted me to him uh, was not only what I've said earlier, just, you know, he and I both come from a sports background. I was attracted to that. He was a handsome guy. Uh, but he was also just really witty, and uh, he would just have people rolling in the aisles just uh, with his witticisms that he perfected over the years. And the combination of that uh, personality, uh, w the ability, and some people have it and some don't, just to be very effective one-on-one, -on -one, and he's the master of it. Um, and when he walks in a room, he just he takes the room over. And uh, so he, he, was, uh, he was extremely effective. And did he spend a lot of time uh, in the fall of 74 in the state? Yes, he was here a lot, and uh, I was with him most all of the time that he was here, and um, uh, it, was, um, it, was a, it was a tough, tough race, and I know it had to be extremely draining on him because I, I think he, there were lots of times he thought he was going to lose that race and, and trying to figure out what am I going to do um, because uh, he hadn't. Uh, being in politics uh, was pretty much all he had done after he came back from the war so severely injured. And when you two were alone, uh, just on the campaign trail, how did you interact? What, what was that like? Oh, we just talked mostly 
politics. I mean, we, we were focused. I mean, we, we talked about who's going to meet us here, what's the lay of the land politically, who's for us, who's against us, what do we need to do to get this county. That, it was that kind of thing. How do you imagine he became aware of uh, Dr. Roy's uh, abortion activities? I think it was pretty common knowledge, frankly. Um, I don't think it was due to any great political research or anything like that. I think it was just, you know, people kind of kind of knew that. But up to that point, it probably wasn't something that would have been brought up in a campaign. Um, and. Um, uh, but it, it just became um, a watershed event in that 74 race that has really impacted Kansas politics ever since. Do you think he had any inkling of, of its potency? I'm not sure. I, I, honestly, I don't think so. Um, I just think he probably, um, he probably thought that it was a, 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 a touchy issue. He knew he wasn't involved. Uh, it was just it was a defining factor between the two men and I just felt he, he thought it was fair game to bring it up. And there were a lot of people booing when that debate ended. Yes there were. I mean it was a nasty it was a nasty ending. Um, it, it got very acrimonious. And when he came off the stage or the next day, did you did you say to him, "Don't do that again, Bob"? Or <laughs> no, I I didn't. Uh, he I I don't remember that day toward the end of it much. Uh, I don't think we were then together after that for a day or two. But it was clearly, and nobody had to tell him. He he knew uh, that that was uh, a mistake. So, for the rest of the campaign. He didn't. He didn't go there again. Is that right? Pretty much. I don't remember him doing much uh, along that along that line after that. Um, but the uh, anti-abortion forces really kind of picked that up from that point forward, and for the most part, at least to my knowledge. Uh, they independently began a very active campaign against Bill Roy using handouts and so on and so forth, uh, emphasizing that issue. And that was kind of new too in the American political landscape. Yes, it was. Um, now, there, there may have been others involved in that, but it certainly wasn't me and it certainly wasn't Bob Dole. It just seemed to me like, as an observer of that, that it kind of it kind of began and, and got its own legs. Now, some people have said, of course, that uh, Dole's repudiation of it never happened. Um, I don't. I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember him repudiating that necessarily. I, I just think he just. That after that Hutch debate, I don't think he spoke about it much at all, one way or the other. Though he must have seen or sensed, or you must have, that it was trending well in your direction. Well, it was so close, it was hard to tell what, what was having the impact. Uh, my own view from, and we were, the only thing I can track for sure was the political ads, the mudslinger ads and the graffiti ads that we had on, on the air, and I was tracking that on a daily basis, and I could tell pretty clearly that they were having a positive impact in our favor. But it's so difficult to measure independent uh, activity in a campaign. You don't really know what's working and what's not. What about the uh, charge that uh, Bill Roy was AWOL in terms of veterans, in support of the veterans? Well, we even, we even uh, put out a flyer about that. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, some of the charges that Bill Roy made against Bob in, in the campaign were just ludicrous. Uh, and two that come to mind were, you know, part of the uh, things, uh, some of the things he was saying was pointing out that Dole voted against the veterans. Well, it was ridiculous. If ever there was a champion, it was him. Roy would pick out an isolated vote uh, where Dole voted one way, but wouldn't point out that he came back and put an amendment on it and voted on something that passed. Same thing with the agriculture votes. And so we felt that in light of that, that was fair game. We, we went after him and put out flyers. Uh, we used big tabloids that focused in on many of these issues, like the veterans issues and agricultural issues. And again, we put people out on the road all over Kansas handing these things out to anybody that would take one. How did you attack Roy on the farm issue? 
Uh, it was pretty much, uh, again, about uh, his lack of knowledge on the issues and his absenteeism on voting on some things that were critical to the state of Kansas. Was that a uh, common political technique uh, before then, do you think? Do you go through, comb through a sitting member of Congress's record and find some time when they supposedly voted against something? It was the first time I'd ever seen it. I mean, it may have been going on around, around the country, I, I don't know, but it was the first time I had personally had any um, connection with it. Um, I do know that those mudslinger and graffiti ads uh, got people's attention because I got calls from all over the country. I remember John Tower calling me from Texas when he was in a tough race wanting to know if I, I could put him on to who could make a uh, mudslinger ad for him. So you hadn't, you hadn't, right. co you hadn't copyrighted mud? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, were there was there more than one quote unquote graffiti ad or, or the graffiti ad was different from the mudslinger ad the graffiti ad showed a guy that would say that the the uh, dialogue was the same but instead of the mud hitting the poster it had a guy with a black marker putting a mustache on Bob Dole and a goatee and horns and things like that and of course they would then reverse when uh, you you told the truth um, but there were really only two ads, Mudslinger and Graffiti. When all was said and done, did uh, the senator come to you and say thanks for uh, a good campaign? Well, he did. Uh, the morning after uh, that race, uh, election was won, uh, we were on national television with uh, the Today Show, or I can't remember who it was, but out in front of the Ramada in there, and one of the first things he said is, I want to thank Dave Owen for managing this campaign for me to victory. Some, I've seen that since, that clip, somebody put it together. I think Ted Koppel put that clip in a piece uh, a few years ago, but I, I don't have it or haven't seen it, but yes, he did. So <clears throat> what, what was your next uh, service with, with Senator Doyle? Well, um, the, the next thing that happened was um, uh, of course, I had uh, decided not to run for re-election, and uh, the next thing that happened, of course, was a presidential race. And um, uh, he suggested to me that uh, he was going to be for Gerald Ford and ask if I wanted to be a part of that campaign. And so, um, I, I, I like the I like the action of a political campaign, and I, I said yes. So, in the primary. I was the Midwest Regional Chairman for the President Ford campaign at the suggestion and request of Bob Dole. And I had several states here in the Midwest, Kansas, Missouri, and Iowa, Nebraska, and North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, I think. And that was when I first um, uh, got involved in presidential politics. And I, I managed that part of the campaign through the primary process. and. And at the, at the same time, I was um, um, elected a, a delegate to the National uh, Convention, uh, which was held in Kansas City. And that was uh, the first time that the uh, moderate conservative factions in Kansas came head to head in a, an important race because there was a large contingent of the Kansas Republicans for Ronald Reagan and the moderate part of the party, which included Dole, myself, and most of our organization, were for uh, Gerald Ford. And a lot of that was because Bob Dole was for Gerald Ford. And we went to the Kansas convention, and it was very, very tight. And I think that really came down again to the organization that we had in place. The Reagan forces were very vocal, and and uh, out in force, but we were much, much better organized through that uh, state convention process, and we prevailed. And so we went to the Kansas, um, uh, we came out of that convention with, uh, I believe, if memory serves me, 32 of 34 votes for Ford, and only, we managed to let the Reagan forces win only two. I may have my numbers a little off, it's been a long time, but it was pretty much like that. And so having 
having served as Ford's Midwest Regional uh, Chairman and then as, a, as a, a delegate to the convention myself, I was elected at that state convention. Um, we went to the, uh, to the national convention here in Kansas City. And uh, again, Bob got me kind of in a good spot in the, in the convention. Uh, Bob Griffin from Michigan was the floor manager for the Ford campaign. And the Kansas delegation uh, uh, had the front row seat at that convention. We were right in the front row, right under the podium. And so Bob arranged for me to be Bob Griffin's assistant in the floor manager in that, in that uh, convention. And so Bob Griffin and I sat right on the front row of the Kansas delegation so he could keep an eye on the floor and see what was going on. And also be there so he could be very close to the podium if needed. And as uh, in that position, it afforded me the opportunity to really be on the inside of what was going on in the Ford campaign when it came to picking uh, the vice presidential candidate. Because I, I went to some of those meetings with, uh, with uh, Bob, Senator Griffin and heard some of the conversations. And after a time or two, it became clear to me that nobody really had made up their mind who, who ought to be the vice president. I mean, Howard Baker was being talked about, uh, John Connolly was being talked about, um, other names which are escaping me at the moment, but there was no clear consensus. And so I went back to the Kansas delegation and I said, you know, we don't have anything else to do here. Let's do something that's fun. Why don't we see if we can help uh, move Bob Dole's case along to be a uh, potential vice presidential candidate. So our strategy was pretty simple. We split the whole country up, the states up, the different people in that 32 people that were the Ford people. And in twos, we would go to the, um, to the delegations of these other states and people we knew and we'd say, hey, we know you're for John Connolly, but if Connolly doesn't win it on the first ballot, would you be for Dole? Or if Baker isn't on it, would you be for Dole? Or, um, you know, what, Richard Kleindeast, I think, maybe was another one. And um, <clears throat> so that was our strategy, and we just did that systematically, and, and we would get them their commitment. Yeah, if we don't, Connolly doesn't get it, we'll vote for Dole. It was just, like, that easy. So as it got down to the end, um, I could tell that we were making some progress because when the Ford people would run the traps in these various states, they were getting back the feedback that I had hoped would happen. And that was, well, we're for Baker, but we also kind of like Dole, and Dole's name was always getting mentioned. And uh, when it really got down to it, uh, I think Dole in his own mind thinks that uh, he got um, he tried to stay real tight with Lynn Nofziger and the Reagan campaign and uh, probably thinks that it was, uh, you know, the Reagan campaign that, that made the suggestion in the final analysis. Who knows? But I know that what we did sure didn't hurt anything because President Ford even mentioned to me after the fact that he was surprised at how many people were talking about Bob Dole when they were polling those states. So in any event, uh, when, it, when it all came out in the wash, Bob Dole got selected. What do you think was the Reagan strategy there? I think, I think the Reagan uh, folks going into it thought they were going to win that, win that nomination. I mean, I, I think they thought just the power of Ronald Reagan's personality was going to save the day as opposed to, uh, to Ford and that the pardon of Nixon would be the, the tripping block that would make it happen. And it, it just didn't. But their supporting Dole as the VP nominee, what was behind that, do you think? Well, I don't think there was anything. I don't think, I don't think they had any strategy on that subject at all. It was more Dole trying to get Knopfsiger to tell Reagan, if Ford ever asked you who you would select, would you mention my name? I think it was that simple. So then, were you involved in the campaign? Well, as it happened after the, the night that uh, Dole was uh, elected or appointed to selected, run, selected and then, and then to, was be, elected. To, to be vice president, 
uh, there was a there was a doorway under the under the podium that went right back under the podium and after after he won I was sitting on the front and uh, Senator Griffin and I just walked through that that doorway back there and talked to Dole then and and I had known Stu Spencer going back years before when he was involved in a state governor's campaign here in in Kansas for a Republican candidate Rick Harmon and it turns out that Stu Spencer uh, who had worked on Reagan's governor's campaign but at this point was uh, running uh, President Ford's campaign uh, he then became aware of how close I was to Dole, the fact that I'd worked on Ford's campaign uh, in the primary. I went back to Washington shortly after the race and walked into uh, Dole's office and Stu Spencer came in and we just all three went into Dole's office and it was almost, uh, well we kind of, Spencer kind of went through a scenario like this, well, you know, we're, we got to get this campaign started. Somebody's got to run your end of it. Dave here knows you. He's worked on the Ford campaign. Why don't we make him the, the chairman of the vice presidential campaign? Now, whether Dole really wanted to do that or not, I don't know, but that's, that's how it came out. And so I took over his end of the campaign in the general election of the, of the 76 race big responsibility. It was a big responsibility and um, uh, the very first thing uh, that happened was uh, uh, Ford went with Dole to Russell and I went to and then Dole went from there on to Seattle I believe it was to speak to the uh, American Legion or the VFW I can't remember as his first official act of of the campaign and President Ford went to Vail for strategy meetings and I went to Vail to represent Dole in those initial strategy meetings. Somewhere I've got some notes of, of those meetings and uh, the, the one I remember so vividly, uh, we were in President Ford's condominium there in Vail and the other people in attendance were my son, was in, in addition to me, were John Connolly, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, uh, Alan Greenspan, Dick Cheney, um, and I think Don Rumsfeld, but I can't remember for sure. But um, it was at that meeting that the strategy began uh, for how the, the campaign was going to be run. And I remember one interesting thing, I even made notes of it at the time, that Nelson Rockefeller turned to um, President Ford and he said, Mr. President, I would highly suggest that you start building up America's oil reserves because the Shah of Iran is not going to last long and we depend on that for so much of our oil supplies. And little did anybody know how all of that would unfold over the years, but he was right on. And um, so Dole then arrived in Vail and there was a press conference. Um, and President Ford was answering questions and the subject got off on uh, the potential debates and President Ford said yes he intended to debate Ronald Reagan and and somebody asked uh, in the audience just to ask um, Dole says do you intend to, to debate Walter Mondale and Dole just said well I'll debate him anytime, anywhere or something. I mean, it just all of a sudden, he was in it, whether he wanted to be or not. And so, I just immediately went to Stu Spencer and I said, Stu, you are making, if we let this happen, this is a disaster. I mean, he is not going to do well in these kind of debates and I want to get you the proof. And I got a, I got a uh, can of film of that Hutch debate and I gave it to Stu and I said, watch this, you don't want this to happen. And um, so eventually, um, uh, you know, the campaign went on and uh, I became the point man to negotiate the debate rules with Walter Mondale and my, my two compadres in that were Senator Jacob Javits and Ted Stevens. And so we set out to establish the ground rules of the debate between the two. Uh, Dick Moe, as I recall, was on the other side of that. He was. Um, 
uh, Mondale's chief of staff, I think, and um, uh, a guy who ended up being a big pollster in the Democrat Party, whose name escapes me right now, were on the other side, but uh, I finally convinced Ted Stevens and, and Jacob Javits that this wasn't a good idea and we ought to try to get this torpedoed if we could, and so we became very difficult to deal with. Uh, we would agree to things and change our mind and, and you know, do whatever we could do. And um, uh, But eventually the debate took place, and it took place in Houston, and um, it would go down in history, I suppose, in that election that as he got toward the end of the debate, uh, uh, Dole made a comment about uh, that the Democrats had started all the wars or something to that effect. I can't remember the exact language, and it became another big, big issue, just like the abortion issue became in the, in the Kansas um, Senate campaign. Um, the campaign itself uh, was, um, was pretty chaotic um, on, the, on the Dole side because Dole was still trying to um, stay close to Reagan. And so here's Reagan, defeated by Ford, and all of a sudden, all of these guys started coming on our campaign, the Bob Dole for Vice President campaign, from the Reagan camp. And it just, so I had, uh, I had Larry Speaks, who had come over from uh, the White House to be uh, the head of our um, communications. Uh, we had uh, advanced guys uh, from the White House uh, on our staff, and then we had all of these Reagan people that came in, like Lynn Nofziger and Charlie Black and um, uh, Paul Russo and um, I, I can't remember them all, but it, it wasn't an easy, it was not a good situation in terms of people mixing together and working for a common cause. And so there was a lot of dissension. And I would have to say that uh, one of Dole's uh, weaknesses is he, he, he doesn't really, he, he's always looking for another angle. He, he will never give people the kind of support they need to really run something effectively. And so, you know, Lynn Nofziger was always trying to undermine me in the running of the campaign, and um, Dole wouldn't take a position, and it, it, it just got to be a mess, frankly. Um, but uh, we got through it and got to the end of it, and on election day, if there had been a few more votes in Ohio and Hawaii, Ford would have been elected. What was your position relative to uh, Stu Spencer, is it? Here's Stu Spencer. Mm -hmm. was well, uh, Stu, uh, of course, and I had been had met each other back in uh, probably 1968 in Kansas when, or excuse me, before that, like 64, 66 maybe when uh, he was working on Rick Harmon's campaign in Kansas. But it was really Stu that I worked with when I was. Um, uh, working as the regional chairman for the Ford campaign in the primary, he was in charge. He was a guy I reported to. And so that's why he was so quick to suggest that I be the guy, and because I was one of the few people in captivity that knew Dole that well and had been working on the Ford campaign. So he was the one who suggested that, um, uh, that I take that role and, and supported me in that. So he stayed with the Ford side. He stayed with the Ford campaign, correct. Do you, <clears throat> did Dole ever express to you regrets for having made the Democrat war comment? No, nope. I've never heard him. Never heard him say that. <clears throat> this is this is fascinating stuff. You're a real eyewitness to history here, or a player, of course. Um, so let's move on then to the next campaign, I guess. Well, um, after. After that campaign uh, uh, was over, it was almost um, just very shortly thereafter that uh, I was in Washington and uh, we went over to Dole's apartment and uh, he was talking about, you know, what do I, what do, I do next? And uh, uh, so he, he recognized that he had some um, fence mending to do, I think, uh, and so that the, the next thing that really happened was um, campaign-wise was, I guess, his 1980 race for president. 
and in that race um, I was really busy with my business and I didn't I didn't get immediately involved in that race what I did do however was while Dole was running for uh, president I put his re-election campaign together for the US Senate and and really kind of did it just using the people that we'd worked with in the past and put put a very strong organization together statewide uh, began raising money for him and collected a war chest to run a Senate race and as that race kind of unfolded um, I went up to I went up to um, Iowa when the Iowa caucuses were going on and helped uh, with that and I was one of the speakers for Dole at some of the various caucus sites and, and I remember uh, I can't remember the town we were in but it was Barbara Bush that was speaking for uh, President Bush that night and uh, Phil, Phil Crane, I remember Phil Crane being there at that particular caucus and a few other people, but I spoke on Dole's behalf and helped through that process uh, because Iowa had been one of my states in the, in the Ford campaign uh, process. And then Dole asked me to go to New Hampshire and just make an assessment of what I thought that was all about. Well, when I went to New Hampshire, um, it was pretty clear that had he really focused in he could have done pretty well in New Hampshire there were a lot of people up there that wanted to be for him but at that point in time he was really staying pretty close to the Senate he wouldn't go up to New Hampshire very often and I, it was just clear that that the um, that the race just wasn't going to go anywhere and um, and I told him so I, I thought you know you, you would have had a chance but the way you've run it you're you're I don't think this is going anywhere, and you need to you need to decide if you're running for the re-election to the U.S. Senate. And it was at that point he asked me uh, because Kansas had voted uh, to have a uh, primary that year. They don't always do it. It was you voted one way or the other, and and uh, that year there was going to be a primary. And he was afraid that he was going to get embarrassed in the Kansas primary if, you know, potentially. And, of course, that was important because if he didn't do well there, he was going to run for re-election or at least. Although I think he was really thinking about not, not running. I mean, I, I truly do. I think he was thinking about not running for re-election. But in any event, um, he asked me to call all of the other presidential campaigns. And ask them not to enter the Kansas primary. So I called Phil Crane, I called, I remember distinctly, I called the, the Bush campaign and I ended up speaking with George Jr., now President Bush, trying to convince him that his father shouldn't enter the, the Kansas race. I called uh, uh, Jack Ranson on behalf of John Connolly's campaign and um, I have to say, none of them were very cooperative in that request. <laughs> but in any event, before that all came about, Dole dropped out of the race and ran for re-election. And frankly, because the organization and the money were in place, he had a pretty easy time of it and no real competitor. Um, and uh, so that was that. Was that. <clears throat> I've got to change tape here, okay. so I'll stop for just yeah. a moment. So that was 1980. That was the 1980 race. Um, and then um, the next thing that, uh, well, one thing that happened uh, before that that didn't have anything to do with Dole's race, but in 1978, um, Jim Pearson retired uh, from the, the U.S. Senate, and so there was a Kansas Senate seat open at that time. and. I had thought for a long time I might be interested in that, but I, again, I was just too involved in my business and had too much financially at stake to, to do that. But everyone who was running, uh, of course, approached me to be helpful to them. And uh, my friend Wayne Angel was in that primary. Uh, Sam Hardage from Wichita was in it. And then, of course, Nancy Kassebaum. And um, after the... Um, 
Uh, and, and so I tried to stay kind of out of it because I sure didn't want to uh, take sides against my friends in that race if I could avoid it. So I just kind of set it out. And then after Nancy Kassebaum won the primary, the, she came to me, uh, she and her sister-in-law, I believe it was, and asked if I would help. So I became the vice or co-chairman of the Kassebaum for Senate race in 1978. And uh, I'll never forget this. One of the interesting things when the, when we first got involved in it, the first thing she had to do was debate Bill Roy at uh, Cake TV in Wichita. And um, so when uh, we went down to the race, I told her, don't tell anybody that I'm with you. Let's just walk into the studio. And so we did. We went down and... Um, uh, Bill Roy had his uh, same cadre of people together that had run against us in the in the '74 race, and and I, I don't know if they'll admit it to, to this day, but when I walked in with Nancy Kassebaum, I think they sucked a lot of air because they knew the race was on, and um, so um, I, then I, I worked on her campaign and helped helped uh, put together. Uh, commercials and an advisor and of course she won the campaign very handily and and served in the Senate for many years and then after that in 1984 I finally kind of had my business uh, together and so I decided to run for governor of Kansas and uh, I put together again just like I'd always done a very uh, very very extensive campaign uh, organized all over the state and uh, felt like uh, I had a, an excellent chance of, of winning that race. And at the very last minute, the incumbent governor at that time was a Democrat, John Carlin, who went on to become the head of the, I believe, the National Archives or something in, in Washington. And um, as we got toward the end of that race, he, he made a very smart political move uh, in the primary. He got a guy from my home county here, Johnson County, who was a political figure himself, Wendell Lady, who had been Speaker of the House. Uh, he got Wendell Lady to enter the Kansas primary uh, because I think he saw the same polls I did, that I could beat John Carlin. And Wendell got in to the race, and the payoff was that if John Carlin won re-election, Wendell got appointed to the Kansas Board of Regents. And, and that is exactly what transpired. He took enough votes away from me in Johnson County that I narrowly lost the primary. And then John Carlin, uh, Sam Hardage from Wichita, won the race. and, and uh, John Carlin just beat the socks off of him, and it was no contest. And Wendell got appointed to the State Board of Regents. Uh, so I congratulate John Carlin on a great political move. If I'd have thought of it, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> uh, but in any event, that was my last uh, time to run for anything myself. And then, of course, Dole comes up again in 1986 for uh, re-election to the um, um, to the Senate, and again, I was very active. I think at that point, uh, we let Kim Wells be the chairman of the campaign, and I was the finance chairman. And um, again, we just put the organization together and everything together for Dole, and he won very handily. Um, so that that was the end of, of that race. Uh, did Dole ever express any ex exasperation with you having uh, worked on the Kassenbaum campaign? Or no, that? not at all. No, he, it was not an issue. He, it was not an issue at all. Okay, well this brings us then to 88, I guess. 1988, um, of course Dole was um, uh, running for uh, president at that time, and toward the, it, it kind of gotten the thing kicked off. And, and the first uh, event I went to was at uh, uh, in Washington uh, when he had a, a one fairly large um, fundraiser, and I went I went up to that. I had been helping um, 
uh, Barbara Norris and some others who were involved with the fundraising aspect of his campaign up to that point and uh, decided that I would do whatever I could do to help in, in that race and so I eventually would, became the, the National camp, uh, Finance Chairman for the Dole for President uh, Committee and um, began to function in that capacity, uh, setting up fundraisers for him uh, all over the country and um, doing my part to, to try to make that campaign a success. Um, at the same time, uh, Elizabeth was the head of the Department of Transportation. And kind of an interesting sidelight that really ties all into all of this. Uh, one day I went to visit Elizabeth um, at her office at the Department of Transportation and I went in really just to stop by and say hello and um, I of course had first met her in, in um, 1974 because she came into Dole's life at that point and they got married shortly after that so she was around in the 76 uh, race but um, not not nearly as much as she was going to be in the, in the 88 race and so I went by and said hello and I just offhandedly asked her if there was anything I could do for her or it'd be helpful and she said well you know I need somebody to look after my finances and I said well you know, I mean I, I'm I'm a banker by trade so I guess that was a natural question for her to bring up with me and I, I said, well, whatever I can do to help, and she said, if you'll come back tomorrow, uh, I'll have some stuff and, and, and we can, uh, you know, I'll give it to you. I went back the next day and stopped in thinking that I would go in and we would sit down and go over. I didn't know what it was that the issue was, but uh, I was there to help. And her secretary came out and said, Elizabeth's tied up, but she wanted me to give you these. And she gave me two big brown grocery sacks. And I thought maybe I got a bunch of unbalanced checkbook statements. I don't know what I had in there, but I was on my way to the airport. So I stuffed them in my suitcase. I got on the airplane and flew back to Kansas City. I got back to the bank and uh, back home and opened them up. And lo and behold, here were life insurance policies, uh, uh, stock certificates, bank accounts, everything that she had uh, in the way of finances. and and a note asking me to, you know, kind of get this organized and take care of it for her. So um, I, I took over uh, managing her affairs, uh, you know, I was on her checking accounts and, and managed her business uh, as far as her investments were concerned. Uh, that was when we bought the property down in um, Florida that they still own. Um, she had quite a number of mutual fund investments and uh, I began to make some changes in some of those. And uh, then there was a fellow by the name of Mark McConaughey who was Dole's um, uh, staff guy on the Senate Finance Committee. And he had left and gone to work for uh, Price Waterhouse. And the Doles asked Mark to set up a blind trust for Elizabeth for her, her activities. And so he set that up and I think one of the monumental mistakes in history was that he set this trust up, blind trust up, and named it the Elizabeth Dole Blind Trust. Well now, how in the world is it going to be blind if it's called the Elizabeth Dole Blind Trust? Well, that, it, that plays a very important role in the rest of, rest of the story. Uh, so we, Mark and I worked together and we transferred all of these assets into the Dole Trust and again, uh, he was the advisor but I was the guy that wrote the checks and made the decisions and, and um, on, with his advice and counsel of course. And that went on for um, quite a long period of time and one of the most crucial times came in October of 1987. Uh, there was one day in the presidential campaign where 
we started the day, or at least the day before, I think, and I was with Dole on Wall Street in New York City, and we went in. There was a meeting, I think, at Morgan Stanley, and they had investment bankers from all over the place in that room talking about the economy, and, and, uh, and, and so I paid close attention to what they were saying about the future of the stock market. We left there, and then Elizabeth and I went to Dallas for a fundraiser that I'd set up there with Bob Crandall, the chairman of American Airlines. And uh, so we had that lunch and uh, sat at his table and kind of hearing his perspective of what was going on. Then we went over and met with Ross Perot at his office and his son, who was trying to build an airport out there uh, in Dallas. And of course, uh, we uh, again paid close attention because this is one of America's lead leading businessmen. Then we fly to California and we had dinner with, uh, uh, or excuse me, we had uh, went by and had a meeting with President Ford at his home and then had dinner with Stu Spencer and his girlfriend. Well, all of that kind of gave me the inclination that there was a lot going on in the market that was, I wasn't quite sure how to read the tea leaves, but, oh, and the other person that was in the picture here was Alan Greenspan. He was at one of those, those um, events as well. So as I was getting on the plane, I just, I just decided this is a little bit unstable, and I called the broker at Merrill Lynch, and I just sold everything she had. And this was like October 1st or 2nd of 1987. And I believe that whatever the date was in October, the stock market just took the huge crash, and we totally avoided that crash and, uh, and had her in cash, and then was able then after that to come back and and take advantage of the market as it began to to recover. So that was a that was a crucial a crucial investment decision at that point on her behalf that that saved her a lot of money. Um, and she was privy to this decision or not? No, she was not. I never discussed any of that with her. Um, it was my job to make the decisions and, and part of it was it was a blind trust and she wasn't supposed to know so she didn't. Had you been handling other people's money? No, I, other than just as president of the bank and that sort of thing. So, and the reason I, I say all this is because this all comes into play as, as it goes on down the, down the line because um, uh, Elizabeth then asked me if um, if I would uh, help her, she wanted to go out on the road on her own and raise some money for the campaign. And so I set up a whole series of fundraisers uh, for Elizabeth, and it was just she and I going out on his campaign uh, trail to raise his capital. I think we raised a million, million and a half dollars in probably 60 days, uh, just her going out and speaking. And the tagline in those uh, races, but I, I would always get up in my introduction and say, we've got two doles here that could be president of the United States. Elizabeth is a very capable person in her own part, and uh, of course we're, we're running the campaign for Bob Dole, but uh, it was that kind of spin that I always put on it, and she liked it. <laughs> so, uh, but Elizabeth and I always got along extremely well. Um, the the turning point for me in that campaign, really a turning point in my life, was in, I want to say it was the first part of November, I got a call from the Harris newspapers in Hutchinson, Kansas, who had been an, ad, uh, an adversary of Dole's his whole political career. And they had put a research reporter on the Dole campaign and they were doing an investigation of me. And the reason they were doing that was because I was the person that everybody in Kansas knew was close, the closest guy to Bob Dole. And of course, he was just getting ready to go into the Iowa caucuses against George Bush. And so they were scrambling around for anything they could come up with uh, that would cause Dole damage going into the Iowa caucuses. And at Dole's request, um, back in, I guess it would have been 
1986, uh, a fellow by the name of Mike Hayden was running for governor of Kansas and needed some help, and I raised some money for Mike and donated it to his campaign, a lot of it coming from my own personal businesses and, and activities. And I had taken every entity that I had control of and made a donation to uh, Mike's campaign and, and presented him with a check for about, or checks totaling about $36,000 one day up in Topeka at the airport, right in the midst of a very tough campaign for him, which he eventually won. Well, when the attack came in the presidential race, when Dole was running in 88 against Bush, Lee Atwater was the campaign chairman for President Bush. And he implemented this attack or approach against me that he was feeding to the Hutchinson Daily News, and they began to investigate those campaign contributions that I had made to, um, uh, to Mike Hayden in 86 and it launched an investigation by the Kansas Public Disclosure Commission of whether or not those, those contributions were illegal. Um, and so we, we ended up uh, having to uh, uh, really deal with that just constantly. And I, I was supposed to go down and and meet with Dole in Florida with a with a uh, fundraiser that I'd set up for with the, the guy that owns the Carnival Cruise Lines, and I had to call him and tell him I won't be able to come down there. I've got to deal with this this issue, and of course I I didn't feel I'd done anything uh, wrong, but the newspapers were after me. This was a big big deal. Dole was going into the Iowa caucuses, and to make a long story short, it just it just became. Uh, an event that took its own legs and never quit for years. And so I, I resigned from the campaign as being the campaign finance chairman, thinking that would help, you know, if I was gone, they'd leave Dole alone, but of course that didn't happen. And uh, so he went into the um, Iowa caucuses and he won. And, um, but my departure from the campaign, I, you know, I don't know for sure, but I think it had a, an impact on the people there. And the thing that Dole, Dole's position on that was from the day that first came up, after all those years, he never spoke to me again from that point forward, thinking that I had caused him great damage in the campaign. And um, so I began about a ten-year stint in my life of fending myself off from all of these investigations which led to at one point eight different federal entities uh, investigating my life and my activities that eventually led to um, first of all a settlement with the Kansas Public Dis Disclosure Commission in which after all of the allegations were made I reached an agreement paid a five hundred dollar fine and pled, uh, admitted guilt to a Class C misdemeanor, which was the equivalent of nailing a campaign poster on a telephone pole, and thought that it was over with. But there were a lot of people in Kansas, and this again goes back to the Ford-Reagan conflict, who carried a lot of animosity toward Dole and toward me over the way that 76 convention turned out. So the guy who was the Kansas Attorney General at that point decided, took upon himself, his name is Bob Steffen, to appoint a special prosecutor after uh, I went through the Kansas Public Disclosure Commission and then the, um, uh, they brought all these charges, we went to court, the judge, Judge Perrin here in Kansas, in Johnson County, I reviewed all these charges and d dismissed them all, saying there was no foundation for any of them. But that's when the politics came back in it again, and Bob Steffen appointed a special prosecutor. They came back on a federal charge and charged me basically with all the same stuff again. All of this drug on for 10 years, probably. And uh, finally, uh, after I'd gone through all of the appropriate channels in the district court over here in Kansas City, Kansas, I was found guilty of uh, filing a false tax return for 
not paying $4,000 in taxes in a year where I had voluntarily paid $150,000. So it wasn't about justice or right and wrong, it was just about we're going to get this guy. And I, I then I spent um, uh, six months in federal prison and uh, was released uh, from federal prison in late 1994, so I missed Dole's run for president again. And uh, when I got out, I immediately uh, began pursuing a presidential pardon, and in what would have been uh, uh, 2000, as President Clinton walked out of the door of the White House, he signed a presidential pardon and pardoned me of all of those because it had been thoroughly reviewed by the uh, Justice Department, and, and uh, so I have a complete pardon for all those activities. And uh, that covers a lot of ground in a short period of time, but it was a miserable time of my life. And any subsequent contact with Senator Dole? Uh, a couple, three years ago, uh, I was sitting in my office and the phone rings and it was Bob and he said, uh, Dave, this is Bob Dole. He said, I think we, we need to bury the hatchet or settle differences and get back together. He said, it's not right for you and I to be, um, be uh, acrimonious toward each other. And uh, since that time, we talk regularly. I've been the same. Uh, we have a we have a good relationship. And you're comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with that. I, it doesn't do me any good to hold grudges about things like that. I've got I've got too many great things going on in my life to let that drag it down. But it was a terrible time in my life. Um. So so. Your handling of Elizabeth Dole's finances was not the issue. It was your contributions to the cam no, to it, it, campaign. It became my handling of Elizabeth Dole's. Uh, and this is why I mentioned the fact that it was so ridiculous to have the Elizabeth Dole Blind Trust called the Elizabeth Dole Blind Trust because one of the things I had done was buy some real estate for her. So in, uh, in uh, the search of the records, uh, they found that um, the paper trail, of course, of the real estate investments because Elizabeth Dole's name was all over, over it. And uh, so that's when they made the tie between the fact that I was close to Bob Dole, involved in his campaign, handling Elizabeth Dole's blind trust, and so there must be something wrong with all this. But that issue became part of, of a court case? Yes, uh -huh, it did. As a side issue, or as a side issue, uh, what what they really what the uh, what the charges against me ended up being was uh, the way I reported uh, uh, some of my income and uh, the fact that I had not um, the way that I had moved money from one of the entities that I owned one one hundred percent to another and made political contributions to Hayden's campaign. It became a very, very complicated court case, and when I went to court, uh, there wasn't, uh, I don't believe there was a single person on my jury who had um, anything other than a high school education, so it was just over their head, and uh, very easy to, to, to get a conviction. So where did the uh, dog track issue come into all of it? That all came into it as well because Paul Bryant, uh, again, was a friend of mine um, and I had taken him to Washington and he had donated considerable money to uh, uh, the Dole campaign. And uh, so I was helping Paul when the issue of awarding licenses in Kansas came up. Uh, to uh, help him get the track license for Kansas City, Kansas, the Wyandotte County license. And um, Paul had paid me, um, I believe it was $100,000, and I had recorded that in income the way my accountant had instructed me to, to report it, and my tax lawyer had uh, instructed me to report it. My taxes were paid. It was, that was not the issue. The way they brought that into it was that I didn't pay the tax in the right year. It was not that I hadn't paid my taxes. But that became an important cog in the, in the conviction as well.
Yeah, was that oversight on your part or? No, I thought I did just exactly what I was supposed to do. I did it under instructions by my tax counsel. So sort of all of these things. Yeah, it was, it was just one of those things where there were so many things that all just came to focus at the same time. And it was so confusing and so complicated. I'm not sure if I'd been on the other side of it, I could have figured it out. Um, so it was, a, it was a tough, tough deal. And be specific if you can, who do you think was pushing this? Well, I know that uh, I know that every at every turn, of course, uh, the people in Kansas were all close to Bob Dole. Now, whether they thought they were doing him a favor by taking the actions they were taking, I don't know. But you go from the attorney general to the judge that heard my case to the guy who was on the prison and parole board. They were all Kansans, all uh, all close to Dole, and I guess all thinking they were doing him some big favor by. Um, uh, taking the action that they did. And then speak a little bit about your treatment in prison. Well, prison was, uh, <laughs> that was an experience. Uh, when you go into a prison environment, I happened to go to Yankton Prison in um, South Dakota, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and um, it's the most it's a most astonishing thing because my wife drove me up there. We went over and had lunch just like you normally do on an everyday kind of a basis. And then you walk over to that prison, you turn yourself in, they slam the door behind you and your life changes totally. And um, there was a lot of effort to humiliate me, uh, they gave me, you know, clothes that had holes in them, shoe clothes that didn't fit. Go over to, I went over to report into the uh, uh, to the uh, first cell that I was supposed to report to, a room, and the guard there says, uh, we, he knew my name. He said, "We knew you were coming on. You're in this room over here, 100 or whatever it was." There are three. Um, there are three black Muslims in there. They hate white people, and I'm sure they're not going to like you. Welcome to welcome to Yankton. And um, so I was obviously uh, concerned and frightened. And um, as it turned out, um, I spent probably about a week in that particular room. I uh, was eventually able to make friends with those guys and it didn't um, didn't go on, but they definitely didn't like me and didn't want me there and I was able to get transferred uh, to another another room. And I began immediately then to uh, try to get a, a, um, a pardon or a parole to get out as quickly as I could. Uh, judge, um, uh, the judge in the case that had sentenced me sentenced me to a year and a day intentionally because when they do that to you you can't you can't get the record expunged you the only way you can get an injustice changed in that situation as a presidential pardon so I was a sentence for a year and a day and um, I had hoped that I could be eligible for parole and get out so I began immediately trying to do that um, prison itself is a very demeaning situation. It serves little or no purpose in rehabilitating anybody. Um, and you, you, you just have to, it's kind of like you start over in life. You have to go uh, hustle around and find yourself a job, which I eventually did as a clerk in the electrical shop. And um, I eventually did get transferred to um, to Leavenworth Prison to have a parole hearing. And this was the most bizarre thing of the whole experience. Here I'm under constant guard. They even had special guards on me because my life had been threatened when I was there, so I was what they called a special case. And uh, when they told me I was going to be transferred down here for to Leavenworth for a parole hearing, uh, I was astounded to hear that the way that worked was they released me at the front gate, somebody drove me to the airport, and I was on my own. I was supposed to go get on an airplane, fly to Kansas City, and drive to Leavenworth Prison and turn myself in again. And 
in the Dole presidential campaigns, one of the guys I had met was Senator Larry Pressler from South Dakota. And so I get released from Yankton Prison. They drive me to the airport, dump me out on the curb. I at least have civilian clothes on. And I walk into the airport, and who do I run into but Larry Pressler. And he said, Dave, how you doing? What are you doing? So I've just been down spending some time in your, your local prison here. And he was just baffled. He didn't know what to say. Um, and then I got on the airplane. I flew to Kansas City. My wife drove me over to Leavenworth. And uh, then the scaring, scary part of the trip really begins. Because when you check into Leavenworth Prison, even, the, even though you go to the um, to the um, uh, minimum security prison, you check in at the big house. And when you walk in there and they slam those doors behind you, it is a scary, scary experience. And um, so uh, again, uh, they do everything they can to humiliate you at every step of the way. And, um, uh, but I, I got through that okay and I had the parole hearing. And there were mountains of material in support of my parole. We went to the parole hearing, and the parole, uh, again, this is where the guy who, uh, the Kansan who was uh, on the prison and parole board in Washington, D.C., comes into play. I walk into the parole hearing. I had my attorney, my accountant, everybody there, my wife, to, to speak on this. We had submitted mountains of material for this parole hearing. The guy opens his folder, and we begin to talk about the things that were in the file, and he said, I don't have anything in here. There's nothing in your file about all of this material you presented, and so I guess I have no choice but to deny your parole. And it was, again, a set-up deal to hopefully, if I didn't get the parole, then I would have to serve the full one year and one day. Well, immediately after that occurred, my wife uh, got an attorney here in Kansas City, and we filed a habeas corpus motion before the federal district court. And when, to make a long story short, we finally got before Judge Richard Rogers in Topeka at the federal court. He was so incensed about what he saw and what had occurred to me through this whole thing. He ordered the federal marshals to go immediately to uh, Leavenworth Prison and release me. And um, also ordered that the Bureau of Prisons had no further uh, control over my life whatsoever from that point forward, which was totally abnormal because usually you have to stay under their jurisdiction for a period of time. But So I walked out of Leavenworth Prison uh, that day with the federal marshals there to make sure it happened because in phone calls to the prison they were still trying to jerk me around and not allow, even though we had a federal judge's order, they weren't going to let me leave. And uh, the federal marshals went down, and I, I got out. Um, and uh, it was, again, surreal, because you walk out of there. I went, drove right from there to my office, went down, sat down at my desk, and began doing business all over again. <clears throat> so you left South Dakota. You came down here for a hearing. For a parole hearing. The hearing occurred, and then how long did you stay in Leavenworth? I was, uh, I think, uh, I was there for about three months in, in Leavenworth Prison from the time I had the parole hearing until the time that uh, we could get the habeas cor cor corpus motion through the, through the courts and, and get a ruling. So all told, how, how much time did you spend? I spent, uh, I spent from February to October in prison. And, and again, another kind of bizarre thing that happened was um, in uh, September of that year, my father died. And uh, so I asked for special dispensation, not thinking I would get it. But uh, they let me out of prison for, for one day to come to my father's funeral. And again, I was just on my own. Here I'm this dangerous guy they got to have under constant lock and key and guard. and. They let me out one day and I go to my father's funeral and go back and report back in. Of course, I guess they would do some pretty bad things to you if you didn't show up, but it, it just seemed totally bizarre to me. And you were unescorted? Unescorted. Do you know what the common practice is in, in Kansas uh, with white collar crime where people go to serve their time? Not really. I, 
I, I don't know. Because you read all the time about people who, who get to these kind of country club prisons, yeah. but that wasn't for you. Well, the, they would, the people would say that that would be the case, but uh, when you're, in, I think any time you're in a, uh, um, in a prison setting where you're at a maximum security prison attached to it, it's a lot tougher because you have the same guards. They just rotate, and um, uh, the Leavenworth facility up here is pretty run down, and, and uh, uh, so it, it's not a pleasant place to be. I want to go back to a few things that you've you've told me, but but just to complete the narrative here. So, what have you done since that time? Well, since I um, uh, one of the one of the there are, there are always good parts to the story. Um, I was working at the time. I I finally had to um, to decide I was not going to fight this anymore and go to prison. I was working for Jack Stevens, the president of Stevens Inc. in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's a huge investment banking firm. And I had gotten him involved in Dole's campaign for president. He had been a big financial supporter. And uh, so I was running the Kansas City office for Stevens, Inc. when it just became obvious they were never going to let me go. They were going to stay after me forever until they got me. So I went down to Little Rock and I told Jack, I said, you know, I, I'm basically out of money. They pretty much, I was a wealthy man when this all started. And when it was over, I hardly had two cents to rub together other than my monthly paycheck. And so I, um, uh, I could tell after I went to the appeal hearing at the um, uh, Court of Appeals in Denver that this was never going to be over until they got their pound of flesh. So I went down and told Jack, I, I just I can't afford to keep fighting this. I'm just going to give up and let them, I'll serve the time. And he said, I totally agree with that. Uh, you've got my support. I know you didn't do anything wrong. Um, and so I had their total blessing. And I, so that's when I, I quit fighting it and said, you know, here I am, come get me. Uh, Jack Stevens hired my wife to run my office for me. I uh, kept my office open the whole time I was in prison. Uh, when I got out, I, it was the Stevens Inc. office that I walked back into and picked up just like the day I left, thanks to Jack Stevens. Jack is just a wonderful gentleman. Uh, he, by the way, was the uh, chairman of Augusta National and the Masters Golf Tournament, a very powerful figure in the South, and uh, just a wonderful gentleman who's now deceased. Um, and then I began just uh, trying to build my financial uh, activities back up. My wife was wonderful, supportive through the whole thing. Um, I made personal investments over a period of time, and then this company we're in right now is really kind of another testament to perseverance because uh, I had made an investment in this company early on, and then it became obvious that someone needed to take over the leadership of it. And um, so I, uh, I did that. I became the chairman and CEO of ICOP Digital Inc. We're a surveillance technology company supplying uh, surveillance equipment for law enforcement. And in the process of doing that, uh, we became a public company. And so we had to go through the approval process with uh, the NASD, with NASDAQ, with the SEC, with the American Stock Exchange. And so you can imagine the hoops I had to jump through to explain what had happened uh, and to get the approval of these federal agencies to permit me to be the CEO of a public company. And I am proud to say that we got that accomplished. Uh, this company is one of the fastest growing little companies in the NASDAQ stock market. Uh, we are very successful, and um, I think uh, the future is, is very bright for ICOP Digital. And for and Dave, for Dave Owen. Owen. <laughs> <clears throat> what about your family life? How did that pan out? Well, uh, I, I was married uh, before my present wife, and I would have to say that uh, all of that uh, back in 1988 uh, really led to the divorce. My, my first wife, uh, she's a wonderful person. It was just too much. And uh, so we ended up getting 
a divorce and uh, then I remarried uh, after that to my present wife Laura and uh, it's Laura who helped me through all of the legal machinations and uh, the habeas corpus motion and stood by me uh, through all of that to where we are today and she's the president of ICOP Digital and I'm the chairman. So just just for the record, when did the divorce occur? What year was it? Uh, it occurred in 1992, I believe it was. Did you did you cover the appeal process in, in your did you speak about the Denver appeal? No, I don't believe so. You want to just cover that? Sure. Uh, the uh, the appeal it was a Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals and um, again at every turn I kept running into people who had been appointed by Dole or in some form or fashion um, I had a connection to Dole and and I'm not saying that he had anything to do with it I'm saying that in every step of the way through this whole thing I was the people on the other side of the table were his appointees or people that he had gotten in office one way or the other. And um, so when I went to the Court of Appeals, I really blame the attorney that I had more than anything else. You have a very short period of time in a Court of Appeals hearing to state your case. It's something like 20 minutes uh, to, to tell them, uh, you know, what, what the basis of your case is. And, and uh, my attorney, uh, uh, after fighting all of that, decided he had more important things to do than go to that appeal hearing with me. And so he sent an assistant who did a terrible job. And uh, the, after a period of time, the, the Tenth Circuit uh, uh, denied, my, uh, denied my appeal. And it was that point that my only choice was to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, and I just I just felt it was fruitless and useless, and you know, here I am, come get me. <clears throat> who did you vote for in night? Who did you vote for in 1996? In 1996, um, I think I voted for Bill Clinton. It's an unfair question to ask, but I'm, I'm glad you, you answered it. Mm -hmm. I thought, and, uh, you know, interestingly enough, um, uh, I grew up, uh, born and grew up in South Arkansas in a little town that's just a hop, skip, and a jump from Hope, Arkansas, where uh, President Clinton uh, comes from. And uh, when I watch him and see him and, and the experiences he's had in life, it, it's, it's so easy for me to relate because we came from the same part of the country with the same kind of people and the same, uh, you know, things go on that, that uh, it's just so easy for me when I read his book. It, it's really interesting to me because it's the same kind of stuff I grew up with. If, uh, if I were talking to you with a different history since 1988, I'd be asking you questions like, well, what do you, what do you think of, of Dole as a legislator, for example? What, what would your comment be? Well, first of all, let me say, I've, I've put any uh, unkind thoughts behind me as far as all of that's concerned. And I think I can, I think I can be pretty, um, uh, pretty even-handed in, in, in the assessment. He, he's a master at um, reaching a compromised position. I, I found that he had very little uh, in terms of you know, his programs, his ideas, and that sort of thing, but when it came to reaching a consensus of opinion on issues and bills that came before him that were hard to decide, he was as good as there is at helping uh, other people wade through that and get to the bottom line and, and take a position. Uh, whether it helped or hurt, I don't know. I think it probably helped. He, he doesn't come to a decision quickly. He, he'll, he'll just keep waiting and waiting and waiting, thinking that there's going to be a better idea here or something else is going to come up. So when he finally does come to a decision, he doesn't ever show his cards up front. It's always at the last minute. Is he a patient or an impatient man? I would say very impatient. 
Um, he has very little patience for the people that work around him. Uh, very insulting, frankly, to a lot of people that work around him. Um, and um, uh, but he, um, he he generates intense loyalty. With having said all that, people who have worked for him, if he wanted them to, they'd come back again. How do you account for that? I think they admire uh, him for what he has overcome in his life. And how do you see World War II experiences playing out in his life since then? Well, I think it had a I think it had a great deal to do with the decisions he made in his life because up to the point he was wounded on that battlefield, he was an athlete. I mean, that's where he thought his future was. You know, he. He, um, he thought, uh, he was said he intended to go to medical school at that point, but I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. Um, but he definitely never envisioned himself having to make his way in the world uh, the, way he, the way he's made it, but the experience of recovering from that wound uh, first of all, it speaks to his intestinal fortitude that he, he did it because most, a lot of people at least, would never be able to overcome something like that. But the strength of character that he showed in, in rehabilitating his body in particular, uh, the same kinds of uh, intense intensity and drive that have made him su uh, successful in politics, he's really indefatigable when it comes to campaigning. Uh, and uh, I mean, I know what the man goes through just to get ready to go somewhere in the morning because I've been in the rooms when that's going on. It's, it's you know, it, you, you take what we do and add another couple hours uh, on each end of it to just get ready to go out the door. Describe that process. Well, of course, he, um, he has um, uh, limited use of, uh, of his arm, so he has... Um, you know, just little things like uh, to, to um, uh, the hand that uh, that he holds the pen in really uh, has more feeling than the hand he shakes hands with. You know, he shakes hands with a hand that I don't think he has much feeling in at all. Um, the the getting ready in the morning is just like buttoning a shirt. He had a he had kind of like a button hook thing that he would have to use to to get around a button and get it buttoned in his uh, to get his shirt buttoned and things like that. It's just it's just a difficult regimen that he had to develop on his own that uh, takes a lot of time, uh, you know, just to get dressed. And he's always dressed immaculately. Oh, uh, I can't imagine tying a tie with one hand. No, I, I think. Uh, he, he, it, he definitely can do it. It takes a lot of time. And what about getting into a coat? How does he get his right arm into a coat? He, he's got that figured out pretty easily. He, he, he can get into a coat, but um, you know, he's just uh, very immaculate in what he do. He'll never get in a car without taking his coat off. He takes it off and lays it over his lap when he gets into. A, so when he gets out, his coat's not wrinkled, and um, it's. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a study in perseverance. It, it's really something. Other little mannerisms that you uh, picked up on? Um, well, he, he, of course, has a hard time with meals, too. That's, that's what developed uh, really one of his campaigning styles. Um, the fact that he can't sit down to a meal and cut a steak up or do something like that kind of led him to get into the mode of, of uh, he would eat something before he got there or eat something after he left, but he would spend the time when everybody else is eating to walk around the room and shake hands. And uh, you know, on, on the few occasions, and of course he, like a lot of people with a handicap like that, he doesn't like it to be obvious that other people are helping him do things, but I've certainly cut up a lot of steaks for him uh, over the years. And uh, so that when we had a situation where we had to eat, he, you know, it, it's a difficult thing for him to do. And he's always trying to, to have food that he can just eat with one hand or something like that. What was your, uh, the high point of your association with him? What was sort of the best time? Oh, I think it was the night we won that, uh, that Kansas Senate race, or the U.S. Senate race in uh, 
1974. Uh, that was really something because it was a tough race. Uh, probably shouldn't have won it. Um, and uh, we had spent every ounce of energy that we had in us to, to get to the end game, and we won. I, uh, I don't want to come back to the troubles that you had, but just it, it strikes me that as you describe what happened to you, uh, the incessance, incessant nature of this, the, the, the uh, obstacles that were put in your path, or, or the, the going after you, was so incessant. There, you know, if you were reading this as a mystery, mo yeah. you'd say, "Oh, there's got to be someone now. Who is it?" Yeah. Well, I think so too, and I, I wish I wish that I knew. I am I am totally convinced in my own mind that it didn't happen by accident. Too many things lined up against me at too many turns when they could have gone either way. So there was there was a method to a lot of it. Maybe not all of it, but certainly a lot of it. And I'd read somewhere that you were described as a little bit of a of a hard nosed Republican figure in the state of Kansas. Uh, do you think there were there was a lot of animosity within the state? I, I think it came from that uh, 76 uh, state convention. I, I'm not a hard nose. I mean, I'm I'm an easy guy to get along with, and I think most people would would tell you that. But that was uh, that was just gut level politics at its best, and that was when the the moderate and conservative forces came head to head for the really the first time in Kansas. And the Reagan people were just, they were very intense and so were we. And I, I made some decisions in that, uh, that process to, that enabled us to win those 32 votes out of 34. We played hardball with people. Uh, to get them to vote our way, and I think a lot of it uh, stems from that because that's not my nature. Hmm. Well, I thank you for this interview. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Is there any way I can get a copy of that? <laughs> <laughs>